Hey everyone, welcome. I think we'll wait one or two more minutes to kind of let people get on the call. Before we're ready to go, Maddie, you wanna start? Okay. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining this presentation on developing automated technologies for cart management. I think you're really going to enjoy the presentation. We have um, some great experts here to talk about it. Um, so you can add questions to the chat box like the last sessions. And um, as you already know, these are being recorded so you can listen to them in the future. So my name is Madison Rogers and I am a water resources engineer at EOR. So I work on projects related to stormwater management, design and permitting, hydraulic and hydrologic modeling and floodplain management. I'm excited to be here with you all today at MOD. Um, I'm ready to learn some stuff about watershed district engineering and management. So as a host of this session, uh, UR has been asked to share a little bit about our company and the work we do. So first I'm going to share a video that explains some of the history of UR. And then after that two minute video, I'm going to talk a little bit about what UR has been up to recently, um, starting with some of the initiatives we've been working on internally, as well as some projects. And then after sharing a couple slides with you, I'm going to introduce our speakers and they will dive into the presentation they've prepared for you today. So I'm gonna share my screen. All right, share my sound. I think what is special about this company is that we are water centric. Most cities are founded on a river or some sort of water body. We think of water as plentiful and clean and we take it for granted, but people are starting to realize that it is a finite resource and we have to be better stewards of it. Really what propelled us to start the company, there was a lot of frustration seeing that water resources and water resources management was always an afterthought. Something that you do at the end of your project to get permits and to make it look green. That definitely keyed into my desire to have more of a multidisciplinary look at projects in the world. So it wasn't just that engineers knew everything and they could come up with all the solutions that it needed to be much more of a team approach where you had other disciplines, natural resource specialists and groundwater people and landscape architects. And I think we're all attracted to that innovation and that idea that things can be figured out in a new way. We do water resources engineering, learning from nature, seeing what nature tells us, not trying to impose our will in nature. We have a lot of changing climatic conditions, and so I think there's just the practical side of how do we manage a changing world. And then we also have changing expectations. I think a lot of people are saying, you know, we want our city to be livable and we want some greenery there. We want it to be a vibrant, enjoyable place to be. And I do think that's where our sort of brand of green infrastructure and a green way of looking at design does tend to really stop people on the track sometimes and appreciate the fact that it doesn't necessarily have to cost more, it can actually cost less. We are designing things in a way in which uh, we'll be resilient, we'll have less impacts in nature and the ecosystem, and you know, doing things better. So hopefully that gives you a little background on the origins of UR and the project we work on and what values we hold as an organization. Um, so I'm now going to share a presentation and bear with me. Okay, so hopefully you can all see the presentation. <clears throat> all right, so, you know, we're in our second year of virtual mod event and a lot of us have been isolated during the pandemic and it feels like a lot hasn't happened. Uh, but we wanted to highlight some of the opportunities we have experienced during this time. Not only has EOR been addressing issues related to the burnout and workload management um, that we've experienced during working from home, but uh, we've also been exploring diversity, equity, and inclusion in light of George Floyd's murder and the heightened awareness of social and environmental 
environmental justice. So I'd like to take a couple minutes to share some of the work we've been working doing internally, uh, as well as in our communities to kind of illustrate some of the areas of growth and expansion. So we completed a company wellness initiative to address employee well-being and incorporated action items from the initiative into our everyday work. <clears throat> We've been making deeper connections with community groups and our new office location in St. Paul. Uh, EOR moved to St. Paul in January of 2020. So it's been about uh, 2020, yeah, it's been about two years. Um, so we've participated also in company-wide diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings. And everyone has benefited from increasing the awareness, knowledge, and communication on these topics. Um, but we know we continue to learn and grow and there remains work to be done on these efforts. Um, each Friday, we gather as a company to have a Friday talk on a topic related to work. And we do both internal and external topics. And these really help keep us stay connected at a time of remote work and better understand the challenges and solutions that our coworkers are encountering. Um, so those are just kind of some of the internal stuff we've been working on to share with you guys. So we've completed a company wellness initiative, or sorry, we've, we have three company-wide um, uh, service areas and they're water, ecology, and community. And so during planning and design for projects, we've been making a concerted effort to ask the question, you know, how does water impact our well-being and how can we manage our water resources in ways that are more equitable and inclusive? Um, so a couple of projects to highlight on that front um, are the Capital Region Watershed District Office. Um, this was a renovated former industrial building site and, and it was renovated into the new office for the Capital Region Watershed District. You are helped with the stormwater management um, on this project and landscape design, and it went further to provide some educational features, provide areas of community gathering and accessibility friendly stormwater BMPs, and all of these are helping to further convey the mission of the watershed district and their connection to the community that they serve. <clears throat> uh, so this is a photo from the project of transforming Central High School. This one was great because it was actually one of our St. Paul community neighbors and we worked with them to uh, implement some stormwater management and landscape design features. Um, this is the Rose housing. EUR provided civil and landscape architectural design for the Rose redevelopment project and that uh, Project provides a mix of market rate and affordable housing units and the stormwater management design and landscape design is defined by vibrant outdoor social areas and extending residences living experiences into the outdoors uh, with an emphasis on appealing to a wide range um, of life stages and economic housing needs. So when we talk about restoring our ecosystems, um, incorporating cultural values and understanding how to become a core value in the decision-making process is important. Um, this is a image from the Duluth Area National Natural Resources Management Plan. We worked with the city and their partners to learn what values are important to this community uh, for cultural and natural ecosystem reasons. And this helps to create a more solid plan that really works and works for everyone. Uh, this is highlighting some of the solar site assessments. So with solar work, it's important to <clears throat> know how the landscape benefits and how do the communities derive additional benefits, um, such as the improved water quality, habitat, et cetera, um, making it a community resources resource versus just a resource for a landowner. This is a project in Storm Lake, Iowa, where a, a BMP treatment train was constructed to address issues relating to flooding in an industrial area. And uh, there was a wildlife border, corridor incorporated to reintroduce habitat to the areas. And um, this one was really great. They noticed jackrabbits come back to the area shortly after the project was built, which they hadn't seen for 
you know, decades, any wildlife here. So that was, it was cool to see the actual impact of something. So a couple of projects to highlight in our community, uh, the Rochester plan uh, where we're working with the city to, again, kind of just create a plan that is focusing on not just working for the city, but the city and all of its partners and all of its community members. Um, so taking a lot of those to heart while also providing all of the important planning, uh, planning aspects that need to be taken care of too. So since one of the themes about this uh, talk is automated technologies, I thought I'd share a project related to that concept that EOR has worked on recently. Uh, so for me, what came to mind thinking about automated technologies um, was the uh, was to want to reuse actually because um, we see a lot of automation in the pumping systems and stormwater management has seen a lot of growth uh, and in its ability to provide volume management and also uh, related to the automated technologies that are being more widely used and more available. And this project uh, is the Oak Glen Golf Course and it diverts warm phosphorus laden water from Lake McCusick wetland to an irrigation pond at the Oak Glen Country Club. And in doing that, the system reduces phosphorus and thermal loading to the wetland Browns Creek, a designated trout stream. And to maximize the benefits while maintaining healthy wetland vegetation, the system design includes a series of float switches that prevents pumping when water levels in the wetland are half a foot or more below the wetland normal water level or when the Gulf Forest Irrigation Pond is at capacity. So thank you for taking the time to learn more about EUR today. Um, I hope we see you at the virtual networking session tonight. We have uh, code names. If anybody's familiar with that game, it's pretty fun. So um, hope to see you there. And now I'd like to introduce our panel speakers for this session. Stop sharing. All right, so we have three speakers today. Um, and I'll introduce all of them now and then let them let them get into their presentation. So Matt Koshin has been with the Rice Creek Watershed District for 14 years. As the lake and stream specialist, he manages the district's water monitoring program, and he also develops it and administers uh, water quality improvement projects, including the district's common carp management program. Matt received his master's from the University of Minnesota in conservation biology. Shemek Baer is the owner of Carp Solutions. He has worked at the University of Minnesota as a research assistant professor. He received a PhD in fishery science at the University of Missouri Columbia in 2005. For the past 15, 16 years, he has been working on various aspects of ecology, life history, and management of the common carp. Vinnie Hurt earned a PhD in ecology evolution and behavior from the University of Minnesota in 2015. He has conducted research on a variety of fish related topics, including morphology, development, behavior, genetics, and evolution. He works at CARP Solutions where he is responsible for collecting and analyzing data, improving existing methods and equipment, and developing new technologies to facilitate CARP management. So with that, thank you and I'll hand it over. Thank you, Madison. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, well, we'll get off and running then. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Again, my name is Matt Koshin. I'm with the Rice Creek Watershed District. I'm gonna be doing a, a, an introduction today and then Shemek Bezier from Carp Solutions is gonna be jumping in and talking about the exciting stuff. Um, I'm not sure if any is gonna be speaking, but you're definitely gonna see him in videos. So I'll get right into it here. So the first couple of slides, I'm just gonna talk about some basics on common carp. I think if you're attending this talk, you probably know why we're concerned about common carp, but it's because they impact water quality. So uh, they, they uh, destroy aquatic plants, which can flip shallow lakes from clear water to turbid water states. 
They suspend uh, nutrients uh, off the bottom of the lake through their feeding mechanisms. They'll kick up sediment, which kicks up uh, nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. Also, when they ingest organic matter, they'll digest that and then excrete out that uh, phosphorus into the water column. So they create algae blooms, they make algae blooms worse. That's why we're concerned with managing them. They are an invasive species, but our interest in managing them is because they harm water quality. And that harm or that impact to water quality is uh, based on density. So at a, at a low enough density, if you're able to manage common carp at a low enough density, uh, here's an example of Silver Lake in the city of uh, New Brighton, um, where we were able to manage carp at a lower density and saw a dramatic change in water clarity of that lake. Um, so the goal here is to uh, not eradicate uh, the carp necessarily, but manage them at a lower density. Um, secondly, the second point I'll make, we have a lot of carp in the system that we're going to be talking about, a whole lot of carp. Uh, now this system, the Long Lake Lino Chain of Lakes system is just north of Minneapolis St. Paul area in the Rice Creek watershed. Uh, if we look at the map on the right, it's consisting of uh, Long Lake, uh, which is a deep lake in the city of New Brighton, uh, which is connected by Rice Creek to the Lino Chain of Lakes, which is a whole series of shallow lakes in the city of Lino Lakes. Uh, and we'll hear more about how this system operates, but suffice to say there are lots of carp in this system. Um, if, our, if our management goal is to manage them at a density of around 100 pounds per acre, below which we expect to see some improvements in water clarity, we're seeing at least six times that uh, in our system. The, de the common carp density is about six times that. So uh, we have some work to do in this system. Um, and certainly they are impacting water quality in this system. When we look at the numbers on this system, we're seeing uh, both in Long Lake and the Lino Chain of Lakes, um, we're seeing phosphorus and chlorophyll A concentrations, which are about double the state standard. So Long Lake is listed as impaired. Uh, the entire uh, Lino Chain of Lakes is listed as impaired. Um, but if a picture is worth a thousand words, this is what these systems look like. So algae blooms are frequent and sometimes severe. Um, I'll also note, um, you can see in the right-hand picture there, you can see my cursor, this is Rice Creek coming out of the chain of lakes here. So the algae bloom that originates in the Lino chain of lakes actually creates uh, an algae bloom or a persistent, ooh, excuse me, persistent algae bloom that works its way all the way down through the system. Um, and really in both of these systems, we have very little aquatic vegetation, which is common when carp densities are very high. So what are we doing about this? Well, we ad uh, adopted a carp management plan in 2018. Um, so before jumping headfirst into management, we needed to get some basic information on the carp population, like their migration, uh, reproduction, age structure, population dynamics. We did that with this management plan. So this management plan and the components of it, which I'm gonna be talking about in a second, uh, were funded by Rice Creek Watershed District. There was also some funding from University of Minnesota and we acquired a targeted watershed grant, um, which I'm not sure if they're still doing the targeted watershed grants, but it, it was part of the Bowser Clean Water Fund uh, process. So we've gotten a lot of uh, questions. If people are familiar about Bowser Clean Water Fund grants, you know that Bowser uh, has certain grant assurances requirements. You need to assure them that a capital improvement project or a project over a certain cost is going to last for a certain amount of time. Um, so that's a little bit different when we're talking about a program, uh, this CARP management program. Um, we did that, we, we provided those assurances by, by developing this plan and then having our board formally adopt it at a meeting. Um, that was how we provided those assurances. All right, so let's talk about some of the pieces of that plan. The first piece that we had uh, was uh, learning about carp migration. Um, so they migrate uh, through this system in different times of the year. Uh, typically they're in Long Lake during the winter. They'll migrate up Rice Creek into the Lino chain of lakes uh, in the spring. Uh, they're kind of moving back and forth between these two lake systems during the summer. And then the population moves back down to Long Lake in the winter. This was work that was done by uh, Nate Benet at the University of Minnesota recently published You'll note that the carp population moves readily across city boundaries, across county boundaries. 
So this, this is kind of an issue that's built to be solved by a watershed district, I would argue. Second information piece is, you know, why are they doing this migration every year? Well, we know that carp migrate into uh, unstable or uh, lakes that are prone to winter killer hypoxia for spawning. This is some more research that was done by the U of M. It's borne out uh, in some of the observations that we've made in our system. So the reason that they're migrating from Long Lake to the Lino chain of lakes primarily is to spawn. And so this Lino chain of lakes acts as a carp nursery. Uh, we know that we can uh, uh, do fish surveys in the Lino chain of lakes. We see the reproduction happening. Um, and we know that that's the primary nursery area. Other parts of the watershed where we've done surveys like this, we're not seeing the same reproduction. So we know that that's the key area. Another information piece we got was about the age structure of the carp. So uh, what we found in our system is that we have carp of many different ages, indicating that they're able to reproduce in most years. Um, but the age structure is highly variable, which, it, which is indicating that there's in some years a high degree of natural mortality. Perhaps that's winter kill in some of these lakes, um, but another important piece of information. And all of the pieces of information before this fed into a carp population model that was developed by uh, the U of M and Carp Solutions. So this population model allowed us to assess different um, management scenarios. So for example, if we do nothing, which is what we're seeing in, in this model run right here, and all these different colors are different model runs. If we do nothing, you know, we're at that anywhere from five to over a thousand kilograms per hectare. Our goal is down here, this black line. Uh, now, if we start to look at different scenarios, like let's say we're able to remove 50% of the adult population every year, we see that after, in, in most of the model runs, after maybe a decade or so, we're getting down to that goal. So that's giving us some indication of what our level of effort is going to need to be uh, in order to, to meet our goals and improve water clarity in the system. All right, so now we know uh, all of these key components. And you know, I would argue that to have a successful CARP management program, you really do need to take the time to collect all of these pieces of information to build a good plan. Okay, you can't put the carp before the horse. Uh -huh. So we got all those pieces of information and now we're ready to act. Uh, we know what our long-term goal is, that's to manage, uh, well, it's to reduce the carp population and then sustain it at a low level, below about 100 pounds per acre. Uh, annually, that means that we're gonna be trying to remove at least 50%, probably more like 60 or more, percent of the carp population every year. So that's a pretty heavy lift. Uh, and we know that our management, in, or, in order to get there, our management tools are going to have to be, uh, these are our keywords, effective, efficient, and reliable. So effective is an obvious one. The tool needs to work. Efficient, it needs to be affordable. If we're going to be doing this every year, it can't cost hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to implement a single tool. Um, and it needs to be reliable. And that's a key one. It needs to work pretty much every year. We can't have years where we completely strike out. So when we start thinking about some of the tools that were available to us prior to what Shemek is going to be talking about in a minute, um, these were some of the existing tools, the tools before what Shemek is going to be talking about. Um, the first one is winter seining. Some folks may be aware of this. This is where you can implant radio tags in carp and track them during the winter. Um, they tend to aggregate in the winter. So in this map on the left here, you can see we had 39 carp that were implanted with radio tags. And this particular date, this is February 4th, 2016, we had 36 of those radio tags in a relatively small area. What you can do then is work with a commercial fisherman to try and uh, seine under the ice, get those carp out. This can be very effective, can be very efficient when it works. Unfortunately, it's not always reliable. Oftentimes, uh, commercial fishermen are hitting snags under the ice due to no fault of their own. I mean, especially in the metro area like this, we've got a, a sunken canoe on the bottom of that lake. They hit a snag, they lose the fish. Um, so while we're not going to jettison or you know, ignore this tool completely in the future, um, we know that it's not always reliable. Uh, another existing management tool, winter aeration. We know that if we aerate these unstable habitats like the Lino chain of lakes here, and we can sustain panfish populations, then we can keep uh, carp reproduction at low levels. But thinking about the 
um, you know, trying to aerate five connected shallow lakes here completely throughout every winter, that's just not practical. It's not really, doesn't really check any of our boxes here, effective, efficient, or reliable. So where does that leave us? Well, Shemek is going to be talking about some of the tools that we developed. We know that they need to be effective, efficient, and reliable. We need to think about all of those different components, effective, efficient, and reliable, as the population changes. Uh, changes. So for example, um, as we're making progress and the population declines, does the efficiency of some of those tools change? Um, also, we need to think about the reliability of some of those tools as CARP, you know, quote, learn. They can change their behavior based on some of the management tools that are used. Um, and we need to remain flexible. We need to, you know, I talked about some of the tools like winter aeration or uh, under the ice netting. Even though those don't check all of our boxes, we need to think about perhaps using those when we can in the future. So we need to stay flexible, have multiple tools available. So that's where I'm gonna leave it. Now Shemek is gonna jump in and uh, talk about uh, the exciting stuff, some of the new tools. Can you guys see my slides okay? Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Madison, for the introduction. I'll jump right in. Uh, before I before I do though, I, I have to provide a statement of uh, conflict of interest because I work at the U of M and at CARP Solutions, uh, which is a company involved in the development of management strategies for invasive fish. Um, the uh, interests related to the conflict of interests are reviewed and managed by the University of Minnesota in accordance with its policy. Okay, so let's move on right ahead to this first technology that we developed. And Matt was mentioning that in that particular system and in many other systems, carp do migrate to spawn. And this will illustrate the importance of collecting the data to develop a targeted management strategy. So I'm gonna share this movie with you that describes essentially the, the process and then I'll talk about the, uh, the results. Rice Creek in New Brighton, Minnesota, and we are doing a field test of a new technology for uh, removing invasive carp, common carp, from the stream.
Okay, well, hopefully you're still with me. Um, <clears throat> so this technology is, the concept is pretty straightforward. The carp are running upstream to spawn. We're using a mild electric field to direct them into a trap. And then another set of electrodes to aggregate them over conveyors and then remove them from the water. So again, we, we want to automate the process as much as possible. So let's look at the results from this spring 2021. That video was showing that when the carp are approaching the, the system, we have an antenna on the bottom that scans those fish and detects the tagged carp. We have a few hundreds of tagged carp in the system. And the data is then downloaded to a website so we can, we can see the activity at the barrier um, every day. And that's what's shown here by those blue columns. This is the number of tagged carp approaching the electric barrier. And the yellow or orange columns show the number of carp that were actually caught in the trap on each day. So you can see that the spawning run started in mid-March and continued through late May. And the carp were trying to cross that barrier basically on a daily basis. You see those blue bars are showing up pretty much every single day. But they were going inside the trap in large numbers only, uh, I would say, on, on, uh, once in a while, only every several days. And in fact, you see those really tall orange columns uh, on two dates where we caught almost 2,000 carp each. So um, um, this is the behavior that we don't quite understand yet why on some days carp go into the trap and others uh, not. But overall, this effort was quite successful. Uh, so we had 500 uniquely tagged carp that were detected at the barrier throughout the whole season. And we captured uh, 10,348 carp in the trap and removed them. And of those that we removed, we scanned over 6,000 to look for tags. And among those, there were 232 pit tagged carp. So the ratio of tags to untagged was about 3.7%. 3, 3 so about every 30th carp was tagged. So based on that, we can estimate how many carp are running throughout the whole uh, spawning season. And that was about 13,500. So we estimate that we removed 76% of the migrating carp. So it's a little bit higher than we're showing in that video. We were running that data again just recently. So that was quite successful. We removed most of the carp that were attempting the spawning migration. Another good thing about this technology is that the, the bycatch, which are fish other than carp, uh, was quite low, over 200 fish, and those were released. Uh, I was mentioning, we learned some interesting things about the behavior of the carp. Uh, uh, they were challenging the barrier for multiple days. On average, a carp was at the barrier for almost 10 days. Um, and only on some days, they decided to swim into the trap. Uh, we call this the swarming behavior. This may not be the most correct terminology, but essentially, this is what happens on some of those days when the carp decide to go into the trap. So most days they kind of mill around the area. They don't want to swim in, but on some days this is what they do. They just pack inside the trap. There's almost no no room left in in that in the trap. It's just filled with carp. I think this would be one area where we could improve this removal technology to if we better understood what drives this behavior, for example. Okay, so that was technology number one. Moving on to the second one that we can use in the summer when the carp are actively feeding. And um, this one exploits um, the this, this simple um, sort of fact about the carp that they are social animals and that they can be trained to aggregate using bait, in this case, cracked corn. So to remove carp with this strategy, we use what we call box nets. Those are usually 60 by 30 feet mesh nets with uh, mesh bottom and sides and with open top. And they're designed so that the sides can be quickly lifted using counterweights and trigger devices. So this is kind of what it looks like. We usually set them in shallow water near shore. Uh, using remotely controlled triggers is important because you kind of want to trigger the net from a distance so you are not spooking the carp. And after we install the nets, we are testing it, how, how they work. So uh, these two guys in a the boat, they will be triggering the net remotely and I'm just standing by the net filming it. There are no fish in the net yet. This is just, we installed the net and we're just testing it.
So they just triggered the net and the, the sides came up and that's, that's what we want to see. Um, this is what happens when you start baiting. So once the nets are installed, we start baiting. And then usually after four or five days, the carp learn that the bait is there and they start aggregating their large numbers. So this is from Long Lake. This video was taken by my uh, postdoc, Peter Hunt, a couple of years ago. Uh, one interesting thing here is that there's not only, not, not that it's just a lot of carp, but it's also uh, only carp. We're not attracting any other fish to the bait. As you can see, these are all carp. And before we um, start removing the fish, we, we use another element. We put pit antennas in the net and pit tags in the carp so that we can track exactly what's going on at the bait. I'm gonna use this clip from Vinny's recent talk at NOMS to illustrate how it works. Simply what we do is we go out and we electrofish for carp. Um, we will collect a small subset of the population and mark them either with fin clips and or with pit tags. And pit tags are just little uh, microchips that we inject in the abdominal cavity of the carp. Uh, they're much like a, a microchip that you would put in a dog or a cat. Um, these pit tags have unique identification numbers. They don't have a battery or anything. Um, they're passive. And so we, we found pit tagged carp that were tagged years before uh, and the, the tags still work um, so they last a long time and then by marking carp and then once we recapture them we can get population estimates and the pit tags have an advantage uh, and that what we like to do is put an antenna in the in the box net in the center of the box net around the bait um, and that antenna is hooked up to a reader system uh, so we can detect when tagged carp come into the net uh, and our systems are connected to cell modems that you know can upload the data to the cloud, to the web, um, and we can watch activity in the net. And when, when carp activity is the highest is when we like to go out and trip the nets. So this is an example of um, how we use that data. This is from Long Lake. So what you're looking at is the number of pit tagged carp detected per, per hour during August 24th through August 30th. Um, so for example, on August 24th, there were a maximum of eight carp, eight tagged carp detected in one hour. And that peak occurred about 10 a.m. And during that day, there were overall 17 carp detected. So 10 a.m. there was a peak. We see it on the next day, the peak was at uh, of nine tagged carp and that occurred right around daybreak at 5 a.m. And the following day, the peak was nine and it had occurred about 3 a.m. So this is very useful because first, you see what's the maximum number you can expect in at that particular net. So this would be about eight or nine. Uh, but then it also tells you what's the best time to trip those nets. And we can see that it changes from day to day. So what happens when we're getting ready to trigger those nets? We have to watch the antennas and as the aggregation is building up and we're seeing that we're about to reach the peak, we go out and trigger, trigger the nets. So like the net was triggered sometime at night here and the fish were removed and then there was a few days of no fish showing up and then they started again. So this, this is getting ready for another pool of the, of the net. And also having pit carp at the bait is informative because then we go through the catch and we see how many we caught which is telling us if we miss them or not. So that's, that's a lot of really useful data. Uh, so this is example from Long Lake again. We looked at the data and it looks like there should be carp on the bait. It's about 10 a.m. and one of us is going on a boat to trigger the net from a distance. So the counterweights that are used to lift those nets are sliding inside those white sleeves for protection. So now the weights fell down and the net came up and it takes a couple of seconds for the fish to figure out what happened. But then once they realized what's going on, they start jumping. But at this point, it's, it, they cannot escape because the sides of the net are up and the net also has mesh bottom. So they're, they're enclosed inside the net.
And then what happens is the crew moves in. We have this floating boom that we put underneath the net and we just drag it across to aggregate all of the carp to one end of the net. And then we hook up cranes to the bottom of the net and lift the carp out of the water to the edge of the boat all the way up. And then they're kind of rolled into the boat all in, in one big swoop. So this is about 700 carp or so that are being removed from the net. And they're looking for any bycatch they see, like they found one fish that is native and they're releasing it. Uh, so the removal of carp from the nets is actually the least time consuming process. Going through net, even with a big catch, usually takes less than half an hour. Uh, so this is what we did in, in Long Lake. Uh, I'll talk about some results. So we did two rounds of box netting, one in 2020, and at that time, we installed six nets in the lake. You can see those nets highlighted by those uh, orange uh, um, rectangles. And the nets were pulled on two occasions. And I should mention that when we do this strategy, we want to use multiple nets, uh, usually between four or eight in a lake of this size. In much bigger lakes, we, we often use actually more than 20 nets. So here are the results. Uh, so the nets were pulled on, October, on September 25th and October 9th. As you can see, the, the catch rates varied between nets. So these are the nets one through six. Some caught hundreds, you know, some caught a thousand plus. Overall, the first day we caught over 2,600 carp, the second time over 4,200, almost 7,000 removed in that season, just in those two days. And the bycatch was only three fish other than carp. This is 2021. Here we installed only four nets and they were pulled on eight different days. I made a note here, smaller crew. Uh, the nets, nets were pulled on eight days, but they, not all the nets were pulled every day. This is the advantage of this technique that if you have a smaller crew, you can, you can pull one or two or three nets per day. If you have a big crew, you can go through all of the nets in one day. So if you have a small crew, you can kind of spread this workload over two or three days. With a big crew, you can get it all done in one day. So it's kind of nice to, nice to have this flexibility. <clears throat> so here are the results from eight different days. And <clears throat> these are numbers of carp caught per day. So again, it varies. But overall, we caught over 6,100 carp. The bycatch was 20. And the bycatch is released because those nets are non-lethal. The fish are just enclosed inside the net. So we can get them out pretty quickly and release them. We were also able to run some population estimates for that lake. Uh, so first we removed 26,466 carp during the September 2020, October 2021. So that was two rounds of box netting and one round of spring removal in between. That's about 120,000 pounds of carp. This lake is 172 acres, so we removed 690 pounds per acre. Like Matt was saying, the carp biomass in the system is really, really high. And from our market recapture estimates, we, we think that there is still about 25,000 carp remaining in, in, in the lake or in the system. So we removed just over 50%. Um, we want to get to the management uh, goal of 100 pounds per acre. So uh, we have an optimistic goal for 2022 of 20,000 carp to remove using both of these techniques, spring migrations and summer, summer netting. Uh, also learned some interesting data. It looks like we are dealing with two different sort of size distributions from box nets and from spring trap. The spring trap is the electric guidance system in blue and the box nets are red. In the spring, we're catching both large, this is the length of the carp we're catching, both large carp and small carp. But in the box nets, the red ones, we're primarily catching small carp and not so many large carp. Not sure how to explain this yet. So in summary, we have developed two automated or at least semi-automated technologies that are, appear to be selective 
for carp removal. Um, I would also argue that they are effective, efficient, and reliable to a large degree, like Matt was saying, that's our goal. Uh, they can complement the existing strategy, which is winter saning. And if you have the old three together, you can think about integrated pest management because you have a method for different time of the year. Spring migrations, summer baiting with box nets, and winter sanding under the ice. And I also uh, think that in the future, it will be a little bit easier to accelerate the automation because once you have a good sort of prototype working technology, it's, it's much easier to build upon that. Okay, that's all I have. I want to thank everybody who funded this research and the management effort directly or indirectly. And also follow us on Facebook and YouTube. We have many more videos that show different aspects of those technologies. So you can take a look at those if you're interested. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We do have a couple, um, or actually I just see one question in the chat function if you guys would like to address that. Uh, let's see, from Don Pereira. Correct. Let me just read through it. Uh, yeah, it's a long one, so I'll give you some time. <laughs> Clearly driving abundance to extremely low levels to the point of the population being egg limit is a good thing. However, if there's overcompensation in the spawn and recruitment relationship, are you able to reduce population to that level where overcompensation may occur? Um, you could get the unfortunate result of very high reproduction of young fish in the population. So it seems that some quantitative understanding of the stock recruitment relationship may be important. Yes. Very good question. This is for fisheries folks. The stock recruitment basically means how many young fish are produced per one adult at different population densities. And often as you're trying, as you're removing adult fish from the system, the reproductive success per one fish increases. So this is exactly what we included in those models that, that Matt was showing in the introduction. Uh, so that, that assumption is taken into the account. And that's why we think that you know, you have to remove those fish aggressively over 50% every single year to eventually gain control of the population. I would also add that, um, you know, the population is high. For example, now we think that there's still 25,000 carp in the system, but we are getting better at removing them. And, uh, you know, last, last year alone, 2021, we removed uh, about 17,000. So I think we're getting close. And furthermore, uh, because the nurseries are located up north and the carp will continue moving back and forth to spawn because they're homing to their uh, places where they were born, I believe that even if the population abundance decreases, we still should be able to fairly effectively continue removal with the spring trap. The box netting in the summer may decline because that gets less effective as you're dealing with your carp, but the spring round should still be a good management uh, target. Um, let's see. Next one is, is there a market for the removed carp as a food or fertilizer source? So we as a company don't have a commercial license, so we cannot uh, do anything commercial with the carp. Uh, they are being buried in the ground. Uh, we do offer them to local commercial fishermen in the area. They're welcome to take those fish whenever there is any sort of market for them, but usually there is not. Next one is, Matt, if you want to take some of them, let me know. Sure. To be carp related. Sure. Yeah. Well, the next one is about, you know, why wouldn't our goal be getting rid of all of the carp? Uh, I think if that were uh, a realistic goal, we would shoot for that. I don't think with the management tools that we have now that that's a realistic goal. Um, there are some other technologies being, well, at least in our system, I guess I would say maybe, you know, shallow ponds or something like that, if you could draw it down completely and just completely eliminate the fish population. That might be a realistic goal, but not for us. Um, but there are some technologies coming out of Maserk that, you know, for some systems that might be a realistic goal, but not yet. Yeah, I agree. I would I would add, you know, the, the question from from Don was a really good one. Um, Shemek, there was the paper uh, the um, came out a couple of years ago that you worked on about the uh, down downstream dispersal. I. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you know I think 
uh, there's fairly high mortality rates in the lino chain of lakes. We know that that the young of the year do disperse downstream and join the adult population. But even in years with fairly high reproductive success, you know, those lakes are shallow and we get some pretty severe winter kills this year. I mean, with as low as Rice Creek was, we might see some pretty high natural mortality despite reproductive success. Is that fair? That is an excellent point, yes. And we've been pit tagging young of the year carp in those nursery lakes for several years now. And this seems to be the case, not just here, but in other places where, you know, in those big shallow nurseries, there's probably a million plus carp, you know, those juvenile fingerlings at the end of the summer in a good year. But what happens is those fish don't tend to disperse in the first year. They actually sit in a nursery for two years. And then after two years, they start moving down to Long Lake. And that's actually good news because a lot of them die during winter kills in those shallow lakes. We don't know why they don't disperse, but they just don't seem to be doing that until they are essentially mature. So yeah, so this is, and that was incorporated in that population model as well. Um, there's some couple of shout outs to Eeyore. Um, is there any evidence that, that they may change sp spawner behavior to avoid trap areas? Uh, we have seen some of that with sea lamper in the Great Lakes. Um, you know, this could, we talked about it with Matt, Matt, because the fish are running to spawn and the electric barrier is stopping them. And sometimes they take days and days until they go in, into the trap. So we thought maybe eventually they'll just turn around and go to spawn in Long Lake. We should be able to see that based on the, you know, the equipment we have out there. But I would also say that spawning in Long Lake actually wouldn't be a bad thing because uh, Long Lake has very abundant, strong native fish community with panfish, and they can eat carp eggs and larvae. So that actually would be kind of desired strategy. That would reduce the uh, production of young carp because they wouldn't be able, the adults wouldn't be able to go up to the nursery. Um, uh, Greg Wilson is asking, if you stop removing carp today, about how long do you think it might take them to rebound? I would say pretty quickly. Um, I don't know, if Matt, Matt, if you have any comments. Uh, Quickly. But, yeah. <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> with, with this many nurseries upstream, if you don't do anything, you know, they, they probably will be back pretty, pretty quickly. Well, which highlights why we had those keywords, effective, efficient, reliable. It needs to be efficient. The hope is that as the population declines, while we continue to manage them, the level of effort that we put into managing them also declines and so costs go down. Good questions. Yeah. Do we have any more questions for Shemek or Matt? Uh, Don says, yeah, they will bounce back. We definitely agree. But I would say that you know each system is a little different. Here, I think they would bounce back very quickly. In other lakes in the metro area where similar strategies have been used, the populations have already been suppressed for years and they're not bouncing back. It, it's, it's, it's all about how easy it is for the adult carp to find nursery areas and then for the juveniles to you know, disperse out of the nurseries back into the, the lakes. And then on top of that, in other systems further south, we're not really probably dealing with the migration scenario. Those, those fish can find good nurseries in their own lakes. So you would kind of need different management strategies for those types of lakes. But the, the, the technologies we developed could be used in, in a lot of systems, nevertheless. Two more questions in the chat. The first one is, does the district plan to remove carp annually from Long Lake? Yeah, the district, the district intends to continue managing carp indefinitely, uh, driving the population down to our, our management goal. Um, so our level of effort may change, but, but yes, our plan is to continue removing them. So we remove them as they're migrating, um, removing them from the lake. Those efforts may change as the population goes down, but right now we are. Um, there's a question about uh, telemetry for uh, commercial removal. Yes, we've done that. Um, I showed that one map 
where we had uh, carp aggregated under the ice. Again, that technology or management tool effective can be efficient and effective, but not always reliable. Um, if we run out of time, we can respond to some of these questions in the chat box too. Yeah, we have about five minutes left. So um, we're actually staying on this track for the 11 a.m. session as well. So at some point I'm gonna have to cut it off and move on to the, the next session. Um, any other questions? Grace Butler from Nine Mile Creek. Um, they saw a significant change in the net draw carp. Okay. Well, not, not Mile Creek. We, we did some work there in Normandale Lake in 2020, just one year. Uh, we haven't done anything since then, so I'm not sure, not sure what the question is about exactly. Question about different species of carp. Um, in the Rice Creek watershed, we're, we're just dealing with common carp. Um, I know other parts of the metro, you know, we're hearing about uh, silver and the big head carp. Luckily, we're not dealing with those yet in Rice Creek. Um, we do have in some lakes some pretty high bullhead densities, but haven't gotten involved in managing those yet. Shemek, maybe that question was about the yeah. the time of day that the that the box nets were lifted. I mean, you showed with some of your graphs that that, that varied widely. I mean, some days it would be at, at night, other times in the morning. Yes, exactly. And actually in Normandale in 2020, we lifted first two times, we busted, and then we figured out that the carp had a different feeding peak than we were thinking, and we changed that, and then we got thousands of carp after that. So that information is really, really important. Yeah, to have those tagged fish in the net because it could be in the middle of a day or it could be in the middle of a night. And again, that's really about improving efficiency. I mean, I remember before we were doing that, it was just picking a time. Well, let's show up at four or 5 a.m. and pull the nets then. Okay. And that could result in a complete bust. And that means time and effort and, and money. Oh, for sure, yeah. Okay, I think this is a good time to wrap it up so we can get ready for the next session. Um, thank you all so much for your time today. Shemek, Matt, and Vinny, you guys did a great job. Um, if you guys are planning to attend the Halak Dam retrofit session, that is the same track, so feel free to stay on here. Thank you all so much.